Okay, welcome to the webinar on disaster and climate risk assessment, frameworks, tools, and indices. Good afternoon, I'm Agnes Balota from the Support to the Climate Change Commission project. And before we formally start, I would just like to run through this afternoon's program with you. So we will have David Delatore from the Climate Change Commission present the rationale and objectives of the webinar. Then we we'll have Mary Marta Merido introduce us to Saba and its functions so we can have a more interactive discussion. We will make a quick round of recognition of the participants and then we'll come to the presentation proper. We will allow about half an hour for the open forum and then a short summary and wrapping up of the discussion. So I now hand you over to David Senatore from the Philippines Climate Change Commission for the rationale and objective of the webinar. Hello, good afternoon everyone. So of course, uh, it's a privilege to be, to be presenting the rationale of the webinar to everyone. So, as you can see on your screen, the Climate Change Commission, uh, of course, uh, plays an important for the enhanced vulnerability and adaptation assessment towards achieving this particular objective. And that is towards building the capacity of communities and increasing the resilience of natural ecosystems for climate change. And since about uh, two years ago, the 2011, the Climate Change Commission has been providing venues for continuing this exchange regarding DCADRM. And this is with respect to what practitioners could be able to pursue in short growth in the middle of this attempt and this assessment. And this particular activity is, of course, regarding the 15 community of practice on climate change actions. So this webinar and the organization of the community of practice being organized with the support for the MUGIC projects in mentally of methods for climate change adaptation and support for the Climate Change Commission in implementing the National Climate Change Action Plan. So, in addition, the objectives are the, of the webinar, in addition to the objectives of the webinar, it is being organized as a learning session to arrive at a common understanding on the concept of sustainability, impact, and adaptation assessments in relation to CCA, DRR, and work in our country. So for this session, and this is the final plan, we will be having two presentations which will be provided by our experts to start the discussion, and this will be followed by an open forum. And uh, since there will be two presentations, uh, let me just mention that right after the presentation by Dr. Rosa Perez, the vulnerability and assessment frameworks looking into the IAC assessment frameworks through the indices, we will be able to entertain about one to three questions, but this should only be in relation to clarificatory questions. And of course, we'll be having the vulnerability assessment in the Philippines, so there's operationalization of the concept of selected examples by Dr. Jennifer Domanco. So right after the two presentations, there will be a 30 minute open forum where everyone can uh, ask questions, you can activate your microphones, or you can send in through chat your questions. So before anything else, of course, we need to introduce the profile. We need to give you the profile of our experts. So let me start with Dr. Rosa Perez. Dr. Rosa is one of the review editors of the Asia Regional Chapter for the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report from 2011 to 2014. As a lead author on an IPCC Special Report on Extreme Events and Climate Change, she worked on specifically Chapter 2, which is on the permanence of risk and vulnerability. Her main area of interest include climate change, climate risk assessment, the climate risk reduction, and environmental impact assessment. Our second speaker will be Dr. Kendra Rufango, and she is an assistant professor currently at the Department of Internal Environmental Science in Ateneo Dominican University. She has worked on the competitive aspect of managing climate change, such, such, as, such as synergizing climate change adaptation with disaster risk management and integrating climate change 
mitigation into sustainable development. So right now, let me turn you over again to uh, our moderator for the entire session that handled a lot of JT. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Um, as I mentioned before, before we go through the, the webinar proper, we're going to have MM Radio guide us through SAVA and the different tools that you can use in order to have a more meaningful um, discussion. So, MM. Hi, good afternoon. This is MM. So I'm going to teach you how to use SAVA. So uh, this is what we've done earlier. Uh, we love using our email addresses and then we just click on uh, attend or attend in browser. So for the succeeding webinars, we will send you a link to the webinar and you just have to click it and just input your email address and the one. And so this is the interface. Um, so here on that side, uh, there, there are three boxes. Uh, the first one contains uh, important buttons which we will use earlier for the discussion and this box uh, under it contains the presenters and co-presenters and the participants. So the ones highlighted in gray, these are your co-presenters and the ones in white, uh, these are your uh, these are participants and the box under it is the chat box. So if you have questions or want to say something or you have reactions, just type in. It's similar to uh, Yahoo Messenger or Facebook Messenger. Just type in your message and then click on send. Uh, the bigger box uh, okay, the presentation. So if you want to raise your hand, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. You can click on the hand icon at the bottom, the upper left side, and then we will acknowledge you. Um, yeah, as I said earlier, you can use the chat box to move straight back here. Okay, so uh, on the right most part of the screen, there are four or smaller buttons in gray. Uh, you can use it to adjust the size of the presentation and the bigger box or the presentation area of the interface. You just click on the small magnifying lens on with a minus sign to minimize it and the magnifying lens with a plus sign to maximize the size. Uh, later, when we have our discussions, we can use the microphone and cameras. But right now, we have muted all microphones uh, to limit the bandwidth use. So if you want to say something, you just click on the uh, microphone icon next to your name, turn off your microphone. If uh, your microphone is turned on, it shall display green. It shall be green, and if it is turned off, it will be red. But we're not going to use the web camera to limit the bandwidth usage. Uh, okay, so we can try using the icons. Uh, the first one is the hand. Uh, you can try to click it. Can you please try to click the hand button? Yeah, there. Uh, that's how you use it to uh, raise your hand to ask questions. And then the other one, the check mark, is for a poll. So if we might ask you a few questions which need your answers like yes or no. So you just click on the check mark to answer yes. Can you click on the check mark? Okay. And then we can click on the other button and click the cross mark. Just no. Okay. And then the other button is uh, smiley. So, yeah, if you're feeling happy or if there's something funny, you can use it. And then, the other one is, uh, it says clap your hands or applaud. So, when you agree on something or if you really have strong uh, feelings of uh, contrary, you just applaud. And then the other one, you should not click on it <laughs> until we're finished because it's a step out and you might take it from the webinar. So that's it.
Thank you, MM. I think we can give MM a round of applause. Yes, to see if we understood how to use the icon. Yes, there you go. Thank you, MM. Okay. So going back to the program, um, we said we're going to make a quick round of um, recognition of participants. So far, when we started, we have quite a number from different organizations. And you can click uh, applause when I call out your organization. So we have Sharka from the Spanish Laguna. Yes. And then we have all the participants from Christian A. Action Clima, Environmental Management Bureau of the DENR, Exit Philippines, Metro Padibo Water District, Plan International, GIZ, of course, colleagues from other programs and projects, Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternative, Initiative, um, International Rice Research Institute, also from the Spanish Laguna, and we have also colleagues from UNICEF Manila and Philippine Business for Environment. Okay, so we'll keep you updated as soon as more participants come in, but you can also check every now, every now and then the list of attendees to your left. So you can call it now to see who has come to join the webinar as well. Okay, so just a quick, um, quick shout out. Maybe have an indication of how many participants are from Luzon by clicking on the hand button. So how many of you are coming in or tuning in from Luzon? Okay, we have about 11, 12, 14 so far. Okay, about 16 participants. Yeah, 15 now coming from Luzon. And how many from the Visaya? How many participants? Okay, we have, well, somebody changed their mind. So we have one participant coming from the Visaya. And how many coming from Mindanao? Mindanao. We still have one participant from Mindanao. Okay, so far we have 25 people logged in to this webinar. But, but um, the enrollment indicated that we're about 100 that expressed interest to log in. So I guess they expect more to join us a bit later. Okay, to start the presentation, we would like to call on Dr. Rosa Perez to give us an idea of the different framework tools and indices that are being used when we talk about vulnerability and risk assessment. Dr. Rosa Perez, can you give her a round of applause, please? Hello, good afternoon to everyone. Um, my topic for today is looking into VIA assessment framework, tools, and indicators. This is the outline of my presentation. I will briefly talk about the definitions and interpretation of vulnerability, and then I'll go on to vulnerability assessment uh, before coming to indicators, and then we'll have the conclusion. The word vulnerability originates from so many, so many directions. So we have uh, many definitions, but there is a range of academic discipline that use this uh, term. It influences the development of framework for its assessment, and some are focused on system, places, and activities. Some on individual, livelihood sectors landscape and ecosystem. But essentially, vulnerability is rooted in three other disciplines. These are risk and hazard, or by physical approaches, political economy, and anthropological resilience. Risk and hazard definition addresses the focal question, what are the hazards? What are the impacts? What is the scope to what, where, and when? The key attributes are exposure or the physical threat, external to the systems, 
and the sensitivity of the system. Back exposure units include places, sectors, activities, landscape, and regions. The decision carefully range from regional to global. The next is the political economy or political ecology. The focal question for this are how are people and places affected differently? What explains differential capacity, cope, and adapt? What are the causes and consequences of differential susceptibility? The key attributes are capacity, sensitivity, and exposure. The exposure unit could be individual, household, and social group. The decision scale now includes the local level. Ecological resilience thing is what we know commonly as ecosystem-based approach. The focal question, why and how do systems change? What is the capacity to respond to change? What are the underlying processes that control the ability to cope or adapt? The key attributes look at the threshold of change. If you have an increased exposure, you will have 
uh, exposure and sensitivity, you will have increased vulnerability. But as you increase the adaptive capacity, your vulnerability decreases. And we have these components defined in this slide. Next, please. So in a vulnerability assessment exercise, it is critical to answer the questions such as who or what is vulnerable. Essentially, who or what is vulnerable, we call it the system of, an, of assessment. So what, what are they vulnerable? Refer to exposure. Why are they vulnerable? We so find the sensitivity. What can be done to lessen this vulnerability are included in your adaptive capacity. Next. Okay, so where is the risk in the IPCC framework? I have here, uh, for purpose of comparison, that there is, um, this, is, this is not a strict one-to-one -one correspondence, but a rough mapping to just facilitate thinking and understanding of framework. On the left-hand side, we have the IPCC vulnerability framework, and in the right side, we have the UN risk framework. So V, the vulnerability, is a function of exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity. While on the UN framework, risk is equal to hazard, exposure, vulnerability, and adaptive capacity. The exposure on the left hand side already includes hazard. So it is equivalent or nearly equivalent to hazard and exposure of the U.S. framework. Sensitivity, on the other hand, is about inherent vulnerability. Adaptive capacity are the same, and climate change action could be interpreted as disaster mitigation if we are dealing with disaster risk reduction. Vulnerability assessment, or VA, is a central component of adaptation action. We need to answer the question of what to adapt to and how to adapt. So we need to have an assessment of vulnerability. It will help us to identify the nature and extent to which climate change might harm a country, region, sector, or community. It will provide a basis for device measures that will minimize or avoid this harm. Why do a VA? This is to support decision making undertaken for different purposes. To identify the most vulnerable people, places, and sectors so that resources are allocated accordingly. To design of adaptation policies and projects and to establish a baseline against which the success of adaptation policies can be monitored. So the last uh, item that I included here is about monitoring and evaluation. As you can see from this slide, there are, uh, these are the general units of analysis. We could have people, individuals, households, communities, and population. Or we could have institutions, social organizations, private sector, public and governmental. We could also have places, nations, basin, ecosystems, and sectors. A common distinction is made between top-down, bottom-up, and integrated approaches. 
Okay, the top down uh, VA includes scenario driven assessment. And it is applied, we apply either global, regional, or down scale climate projection to assess potential impact on fiscal or natural exposed units such as watershed, infrastructure, or agricultural The top down VA also uh, is part of classified as indicator base that relies on available software. It could also be modern day and in between is the impact chain where cause effect relationship between different components of a system are depicted. The bottom up VA, the for bottom up VA, the units of analysis are typically smaller and more localized, such as household or community. The emphasis is more on current and short term time scale. For vulnerability to current climate variability serves as a starting point for understanding vulnerability to future climate conditions. Local knowledge often are integrated through participatory processes. Okay, so integrated VA, as the name suggests, combines the elements for both top down and bottom up, and they complement each other. One good example for integrated VA is the uh, demonstration project of the Climate Change Commission, uh, where we derive the Shargao Ecoform experience. Here in this slide, I show you um, the climate change impact for Pilar, uh, one of the municipalities of Shargao, on uh, the sector for agriculture and some sector on rice. So we have specified the, the place, the region, and uh, the, for the climate stimulus, these are uh, from scenarios, the seasonal mean temperature, the number of days with rainfall, etc. And we have the system of interest as I already mentioned. Um, we can also see some potential biophysical impact, potential socioeconomic impact, and adaptive capacity. So in the middle, you can see some results of the vulnerability assessment where exposure is indicated. Um, the one with red arrow, is, uh, in, it, it is increasing. Sensitivity is also positive. Potential impact is positive, but the adaptive capacity there is not enough information to set the direction. So with the three um, term increasing, vulnerability is increasing, or we can say it is that there is high vulnerability. The bottom up aspects are taken from these are the adaptive capacity, the information are taken from the community themselves through consultation. Indicator or proxy. There are vulnerability is such a complex terminology that sometimes we cannot pinpoint in reality what is what is it. It, it is abstract. So in analyzing this system, we need something to to hold on to to be to so that we have uh, some degree of understanding. So we need to simplify. And that's where indicators and indices become handy because these are useful for capturing a complex reality and permit comparison across space and time. 
So index R indices are aggregate measure of several indicators. There is sometimes there is a high subjectivity which requires some expertise in judgment and that must be even more critically appraised. The role of indicator is, as I said earlier, to capture an intangible for process not possible to run through. So this is also called sometimes called a proxy. Example of this is the human development index. Human development is so big that we don't know how how to observe this. So instead we use some indicators and take some composite statistics to be able to describe human development. So we have the HDI, the human development index, which are which is composed of life expectancy, educational attainment and income. So this HDI serves as a frame of reference for both social and economic development. It sets a minimum and a maximum for each dimension and can be expressed as a value between zero and one. Another example is the Broad Happiness Index. Have you heard about this? This is the GHI, which originates from Bhutan. Okay. It measures quality of life or social progress in a more holistic way besides the usual economic indicator of GDP. So for Bhutan, they have included sustainable development indicators, preservation and promotion of cultural value, conservation of the natural environment, and establishment of good governance. Okay, these are four, but if you want to include more, you can include more. And this slide show you the domains of growth, national happiness can include so many indicators. Okay, so it's up to you. In conclusion, understanding who and what is at risk is the foundation of vulnerability assessment. It indicates the strategies and measures that may be taken to reduce risk or increase capacity to adapt. Choosing an appropriate approach for conducting a VA is important because this approach can reveal different vulnerabilities and identify different course of action. There is a need to enhance our understanding of the causes of vulnerability in order to develop vulnerability index. As I showed you, if you want to, to include more indicators to establish your vulnerability, then you can, because that can effectively aid policy development. And lastly, the CCVI are dynamic and must be monitored and evaluated periodically if they are still relevant. So, thank you very much for your attention and good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Rosa. So, we now have time for a few clarificatory questions. But before we start, uh, let me just acknowledge a few of our colleagues who also joined us. That's Marina Water District, that they have about 15 participants at the group webinar. We also have um, colleagues from the National Anti-Poverty Commission and Conservation International. So welcome to the webinar. And this is a note, um, there are about 25 participants in the group webinar in Sharka, um, six colleagues from Christian Aid, and more than 10 people from the Environmental Management Bureau of the DENR. So you can use the hand icon button or the chat function if you want to ask a question. Yes. Sorry, I see we questions? have two hands up, one is from Willie. So Willie. Yeah, you can activate your microphone or you can use 
he had a function to ask your question. Um, I've been informed that we can actually use the microphone on the side there. We won't be able to hear it in this room, but we'll be, hear it, we'll be able to hear it from the webinar. So if anybody has a question, just please um, come to the microphone. Yeah. Can we hear from we? And there's another hand up um, from Jojo. So let's start with Jojo. You can click the the microphone um, icon to the left of your name. You want to use the microphone or use the chat function. Okay, so, so here's a question from Jojo. What are the climate change proxy indicators for vulnerability assessment? The, the proxy indicators for VA are th those terms that you can observe because vulnerability is a, a very abstract um, term. So you use something that you want to observe. Uh, later, the presentation of Kendra, uh, Dr. Kendra, will give some example. So, uh, can you bear a little more and see and hear the presentation of Kenda to answer your question? We have another question, but I think um, Joven raised his hand first. So Joven, you can use the chat function or use your microphone and then we have to address another question raised by Elke. Yeah. Also, okay, so John's question is how do we quantify for these numbers to quality, I guess, qualitative or quantitative indicators? Yeah. So how do we quantify qualitative indicators? Uh, for example, the Human Development Index, um, we have the number is from zero to one. So the higher the number, the higher is the development. And yeah, the, the, there are three, um, the HBI is a composite indi uh, in this index which uh, includes three uh, indicators, life expectancy, income, and educational attainment. Yeah, okay, and I guess we'll get a glimpse of those examples of um, proxies and indices that are being used right now um, in different initiatives here in the Philippines as well as how each of these indicators were quantified when Dr. Kendra Tosanko makes her presentation later on. But there's also um, one last question from Elke. I guess this question is more appropriately addressed to Dennis De La Torre of the Climate Change Commission. The question is what VA method used by the CCC in supporting VA efforts of its partners? So I hand it over to Danny. So in relation to the question uh, by Dr. Jobe, uh, I'll uh, Well, uh, you all know that actually uh, Dr. Rosa is also one of our consultants, and what I shall give the input regarding the uh, what. The, the very mature process right now is the one in Shargao. So, uh, there's an integration of approaches, but uh, the focus is on the bottom-up approach. Uh, we all know that the Local Climate Change Action Plan is supposed to be piloted. So, part of these approaches being done in our eco towns, particularly Shargao, because that's the oldest and that's the that was started. The focus again is on the bottom-up approach. At the end of the day, it will be the LGUs, uh, their specific departments, their, their specific sectors, which will identify exactly how the vulnerability assessment will be conducted with guidance from our experts like uh, Dr. Kenta. Uh, 
and some start on the pandemic. Thank you, Danny. And also to address um, um, Elpis' question and related also to Joby's last question on how do we put exact numbers like in exposure or vulnerability, I hand over the microphone back to Dr. Rosa Perez. Uh, as I already uh, stated earlier, there is uh, some element of subjectivity. So we also need the expert judgment on which approaches need to be um, used, no? But what is important is that we use the same framework because if we if we work from the same reference um, reference uh, line or level, then we are able to compare results. But in terms of approaches, it depends on the situation because there are different systems, different sectors that you need to. Uh, and also the data availability is also a factor. So for deciding which approach is good or, or better, then you have to uh, do some free analysis so that you know which approaches are appropriate. Okay, and Jobe, your question is actually a nice segue into the next presentation when you're asking about um, quantification of the specific elements of vulnerability, so you're asking about exposure, sensitivity, and how we quantify it. So we'll hand over now the, the presentation to Dr. Kendra Gotanko, so she can share with us um, different examples of vulnerability assessment in the Philippines and how that concept was actually operationalized by different groups doing VA to selected examples. So can we give Dr. Rosa Perez a round of applause and also for Dr. Kendra to welcome her in this presentation. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I hope that you can hear me and I thank you for joining our webinar. Um, so for this presentation, of course, aside from acknowledging Dr. Perez, I also want to acknowledge Kairos Mosol, um, a researcher who helped put together the review of related literature. Uh, so I, I do not profess to know all of the examples of vulnerability assessment in the Philippines and in fact I look forward to the open forum where you might be able to share some projects that you know of. But I selected a few here that may be helpful in illustrating some issues or challenges in operationalization. So Dr. Rosa has already discussed the vulnerability framework as explained by the IDCC. Um, and this is mainly looking at vulnerability as an outcome, but also as Dr. Rosa said, uh, the, there's a very fine line between the framework of vulnerability as an outcome and also as uh, contextual vulnerability. And in reality, we may already be uh, doing a bit of work. And this is also just a recap of what Dr. Rosa presented, uh, looking at the different terminologies between, between the risk uh, community of practice and the climate change community of practice. And now that we are overlapping in many ways, mainly because of how climate change is also changing our experience of uh, hazards, you know, achieve whether it's climate related to hazards, uh, the communities of practice are overlapping and we have to deal with our differences in the way we use officers. So if uh, we go through, this is just a simplified uh, illustration of how the ICTC recommends the assessment to be conducted. So you can see how the vulnerability assessment is contextualized is a continuing process of assessing the impact, assessing the vulnerability, taking action, and all throughout monitoring and evaluating as the processes to make sure that the indicators we are looking at remain relevant and to capture what's really happening on the ground. Uh, 
forward to much. Okay. So this uh, diagram from the ACID is actually just to give a bit more detail on how the different elements of those three assessments interplay with one another. So you will see how the exposure and sensitivity uh, components of all of the assessments actually contribute towards the impact assessment. And then looking at the actions that indicate whether it's mitigative or adaptive uh, to increase our capacity contribute to our overall assessment of vulnerability. So if we look at the vulnerability assessments that have been undertaken uh, in the country, our local DAs reflect really a diversity of uh, how we approach the problem. A diversity in terms of the spatial scale being addressed. There have been DAs at the barangay level, to the municipality level, to the provincial level. Uh, diversity in terms of the sector. For example, the, uh, the child and sector, both on health, or culture, water, and forestry. And also, uh, vulnerability assessment, diversity across the different hazards. Please bear with us if there's a little bit of a lag that we change, right? Uh, so here is one example. It's a pilot study carried out by the Pep Asia CBS Network office, but building on the framework provided by the Economy and Environment Program for Southeast Asia, or IFTI, with support from Canada. So the purpose of this uh, vulnerability as assessment is to formulate community level adaptation strategy. And as you can see from the framework, they do approach the three components, they do adapt the three components approach to vulnerability assessment as we say in the IDCC. Although instead of using the third exposure, we have a climatic hazard. But as you remember from the talk of uh, Dr. Perez, the exposure element in the IDCC framework is already a uh, combination of the hazard and the exposure as we would understand it in the risk uh, community of practice. Okay, so perhaps in answer, to help answer that question about how do you put numbers or quantify these components, these are examples of the indicators chosen for the exposure sensitivity and adaptive capacity in this pilot study. So as you can see under the exposure, there's looking both. We have gone forward and expectedly, oh, okay. Okay, there we go. So looking under exposure, uh, some indicators chosen are the number of typhoons per year from 1948 to 2009 and also areas already mapped out to be susceptible to landslides and like, like floods and given a rating of low, medium, high. So just having that uh, low, medium, high uh, descriptor is already a way to put a quantitative value when, uh, when you do the mapping and when you do the calculations to come up with an index. Uh, then under sensitivity, they consider three types of sensitivity and ecological, livelihood and population uh, rooted sensitivity. So under ecological, some examples of indicators are proportions of protected areas and number of local heritage sites. Under the livelihood sensitivity, percentage of agricultural, commercial, and industrial areas, and proportion of households in aging fishing. And under population, the density, uh, population density, proportion of elders, children, and persons with disabilities. Then under adaptive capacity, we have five major components based on the economic situation, skills, information and technology, infrastructure, and institutions. So under the economic category, we have indicators such as income, household assets, per capita spending for disaster reduction, and the Gini coefficient, which measures income distribution. Then under skills, we have literacy rate, the number of health workers, for example, and the number of the DRR, sorry for the title, DRR trained person. Then under information technology, um, DRR communication equipment, under infrastructure, number of facilities, buildings for evacuation, and so on. 
and under institution, membership, and community organization, uh, laws and policies, early warning system, and CRR plan. So each of these indicators are normalized on one scale from 0 to 1, given a specific weight, and they are combined using the formula you see here to come up with the overall vulnerability index. So you'll notice that uh, for the adaptive capacity index, there's a 1 minus the normalized adaptive capacity index. So that is to indicate the inverse relationship between adaptive capacity and vulnerability. So the more capacity you have, the lower your vulnerability. So the source of data used in this pilot study were the CTFS, the local government units, and initiative data and secondary data from national government agencies. Uh, now what I found interesting of this study was how they tackled the issue of coming up with the weight. Uh, in many studies, these indicators are just given equal weight, uh, but here they try to come up with a systematic way of coming up with weight based on expert judgment. And so the DOCRASA was part of this process, and if you're curious, you can say more about it later. But they employed something called an analytic hierarchy process where uh, participants were given a number scale to rate how important one indicator is over another, whether it's equal or more strongly, uh, more important, and then based on that, come up with ranking. So this is just to illustrate how the rate changed before, uh, after, before and after the uh, process of doing that ranking with the experts. So if you look at, for example, the first category on sensitivity, as the ecological sensitivity, the proportion of protected areas increased in its weight after the stakeholder consultation uh, in the expense of the number of local heritage sites. For the livelihood at risk, the percentage of agricultural land and the proportions of households engaged in fishing also increased in their weight, so they were deemed as more important in comparison to the percentage of industrial and commercial land. For the populations at risk, it was the proportion of persons with disability that increased at the expense of the population density, which is one of our usual indicators for exposure. Uh, sorry, I should say for exposure, we were in that risk context, but here we're looking at sensitivity. And I'll comment on that later. Um, and then for the adaptive capacity on the economic resources and distribution, average in Um, per capita and proportions of populations below the poverty threshold increase in their weight uh, in the expense of the income inequality indicator and the average number of assets per household. Then with the skills, uh, you see how importance is given to the number of people who have been trained in disaster risk reduction and who have been trained in the field of health for the number of health workers. Uh, and these, the weight of these indicators increase in, in the expense of the average number of years in school. For information and technology and for the infrastructure, more importance also was given to the number of disasters, reduction, communication, equipment. And then for the institutions, it was the presence of the early warning system that increased in its uh, weight in expense of the proportion of voters, for example, and the proportion of adult population. And then lastly for the exposure, looking at susceptibility to typhoon, plant and stuff, you'll notice there was no change between uh, the first and the, the first set of weights and then the weights given after the expert consultation, mainly because uh, they felt that these maps were already derived according to expert judgment. And so it, it, it would just be uh, duplicating the process to have this uh, done again. So these are just examples of the outputs, and you can see they have it even down to the Barangas level. This is in uh, Carmona, 
and the other day where it was like where it was uh, applied is being manipulated. So the darker colors represent uh, higher vulnerabilities in the end. And as another example, we now move to uh, example at the provincial level. This is the work by Dr. Cabido et al. for NETA, uh, entitled their change modules and annual of game changing climate change and disaster reduction in the provincial development and physical framework plan. So similar to the first one, you see the equation for the vulnerability index is still a combination of weighted sub indices or sub indicators. And this method was will determine the report is validated by the final census by provincial standards. So the approach here is at the provincial level, but it is affecting vulnerability across the different sectors. So these sectors are coastal and marine, health, agriculture, water, forestry, and biodiversity. Uh, there was supposed to be a diagram here. I'm not sure why it didn't translate into the SAPA uh, system. Uh, perhaps you cannot handle the, if you have animation. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. I was not aware it cannot handle animation. So actually there's a diagram under, which just shows how uh, in this method, you still have the three components, the sensitivity, exposure, and adaptive capacity, but then you have subcomponents and subcomponents still so impact indicators. Again, referring back to the method of assessment where the impact assessment is part of the vulnerability assessment. Uh, but here, the way that it is structured is that the assessment of vulnerability is impact specific. We first identify the impact that is relevant to that sector that we would, that we would like to assess that sector for so that the vulnerability is not a general vulnerability but a vulnerability to that impact. So for example, in the next slide, it is for the forestry sector and these are sample indicators that you might use if you were considering vulnerability to erosion specifically. So for example, under exposure, we have uh, extent of diluted areas, extent of upland areas, and the value of crops. Under sensitivity, we have rainfall volume, land cover, proximity to water body, extent of climate, and incidence of Nino. And these are just examples. It really is quite a long and comprehensive list. You uh, were interested to look at the original document. And under adaptive capacity, for example, deforestation effort, awareness of its own population, relocation efforts and conservation practices. Uh, and this is another example from the health sector. So the health sector is looking specifically at water and sector for disease. Uh, so we and these are the common impacts across the different types of disease. Uh, sorry, the common indicators across the different types of disease considered. So under exposure, uh, morbidity and mortality rate. A health expenditure and access to sanitation and safe water. Under sensitivity, again, this is where some of the climatic variables were listed, as well as households with proper sanitation, waste management practices, as well as the age structure of the community. Under adaptive capacity, access to medical facilities, uh, rehabilitation of water supply, your information campaign, and flood control and maintenance. Then, as a third example, the professor already mentioned the Shergao Echo Town Project Vulnerability Assessment. So, this is the example of framework from the Dell Garden Agriculture Sector. Uh, so, you can see that they first look at the hazards specifically and the exposure unit as part of coming up with the total uh, physical exposure, then combining it with the sensitivity to get both direct and indirect. Uh, you may not see the adaptive capacity component explicitly in this slide, but the assessment was done uh, for that very purpose of coming up with the adaptive measures. Okay. So what, what are some insights that we can gain about the challenges to operationalization based on these examples? 
So first of all, there is a there seems to be a diversity in the interpretation and understanding of terms. Uh, those terms being the exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity component. For example, when we think about population, population density, proportion of populations who are elderly or disabled or who are uh, children, uh, or even the extent of vulnerable or critical areas and assets, are these indicators for exposure or are they indicators for sensitivity? So the first two studies I show you seem to differ on that point. So, ano <laughs> talaga? Uh, they're looking at thematic variables like rainfall volume, temperature, moisture in the uh, disaster risk community of practice, you would typically consider these under the hazard. And translating that into the climate change uh, community of practice, we would usually consider them under physical exposure. Uh, however, as seen in the Camilo uh, et al. VA manual, they are also considered under sensitivity. So how do we uh, understand that? And does it need to be standardized? Do these understandings need to be standardized? And then also the, the use of morbidity and mortality rate. So they were classified under exposure uh, for the health sector. Uh, but uh, are they exposure or are they realized vulnerability? So vulner uh, vulnerability that has already become concretized. So, for example, again, if I were if I were to use um, Mr. Robinson, the chief from the risk community of practice, uh, when we, we do disaster risk indices, one way to validate if your uh, to, to validate the components and the indicators in your hazard exposure and vulnerability of your risk index is to look at it vis-a-vis -vis the number of deaths, let's say, in that country of uh, typhoon or earthquake and so on because the number of deaths is an indicator of the overall risk. Meaning, if you believe that the hazard is high, you were exposed, you were vulnerable, and hence that's why a lot of people died. So it's a way to value the risk indicator. So translating that now into the uh, vulnerability assessment, uh, how do we understand morbidity and mortality? Are they measures of exposure or can we use them to validate our vulnerability indicators? Because we, if you are exposed to a hazard and you are unable to adapt, then that's, that's what happens to you, unfortunately. <laughs> and so can we use them as a, a validation? Uh, another practical challenge, the availability and accessibility of data to measure baselines and populate our databases. Uh, so you might be wondering, how do we select indicators in the first place? Of course, we, would, we are guided by theory, by literature, but in a practical sense, we're also limited by uh, uh, available data, which is decentralized. So, for example, in the first pilot study, uh, there's some data that they got from their own uh, CDMS uh, or at the LCU level, but they also had to turn to the national government agency uh, to get uh, other data. So, uh, that's one of the challenges now, and I know that there are efforts ongoing to have a single repository somewhere to make it easier to get the data that we need for Bolivia. Uh, and then another challenge with regards to the methods are, well, the importance of transparency in the methods and assumptions. So what was your basis for selecting indicators? What were your basis for assigning weight? Uh, if you assign the equal weight to all your indicators versus uh, having different weights, uh, how, that, where, how, how are those different weights arrived at? So is it expert judgment or something else? So that uh, it, it will be easier to replicate the process later on when you do monitoring and evaluation if we know what the assumptions are. And it's the same with normalization techniques. So as I mentioned, indicators are often normalized into a common scale from 0 to 1, 0 to 10, or 0 to 100. It's usually 0 to 1 in most techniques. 
just because these indicators are different data types, they have different units, and if you want to combine them, then there has to be a way to standardize how they are expressed. So you can combine them, and that's, uh, that's what normalization is for. And there are different techniques to do that, including process on. Uh, so in doing vulnerability assessment, we need to know uh, what techniques for you. And then I talked that I already talked about uh, validation a little bit. One challenge is how do we validate the images once we have computed for them and make sure that they really capture the vulnerability on the ground. Um, pilot testing with the community and getting their feedback whether or not it is feasible or, or doable is just one aspect of the validation. And then I think we will talk about this more also during the open forum. How do we now integrate vulnerability assessment into current planning methods, for example, the group and You think as much as possible existing indicators and existing databases to facilitate the process. Uh, so for the example vulnerability assessment that I showed, the sectors were the coastal, Health, agriculture, water quality, biodiversity. Under the group sector, it's defined a little bit differently the social, economic, and infrastructure. So, how can we uh, marry the two and make sure that the vulnerability assessment is being Okay, so the question is, are there time efforts in standardizing the methodology? 
Okay, and a similar question was raised earlier related to that is how can BA results be made comparable regardless of who conducts the BA if assigning weights or values is subjective? So how can we make results comparable and whether other uh, archive efforts to standardize the methodology? So actually those are two very related and good questions. Uh, I think if, if I'm not mistaken and forget it again correctly, the standardization of the methodology is the next step. So the first uh, round of efforts of the climate change commission has been to do a more comprehensive coping on what vulnerability assessment have been done, how were they approached, in order to learn the best tools and the best practices. Uh, then with the Shargao Ecotown, for example, trying to pilot a methodology in order to make recommendations for the, the rest of the country. So I think that will be the next step. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to be too, too strict when we standardize the methodology such that there's no more flexibility for the communities to adjust. If, for example, uh, the methodology prescribes the use of certain indicators, but they find that they don't have the data for it. So how do we deal with that? So there's really a need to try a balance between uh, standardizing the methodology to maintain comparability and also having enough flexibility so that we can deal with issues like uh, lack of data or just having a different context uh, if, if and when we do. I don't know if that sort of answers more questions in one group. And yes, certainly. Uh, certainly, uh, of course, what can I add to what our experts have already mentioned, uh, except that offhand, uh, we're, we're also looking into, say, why don't we come up with a full range of multi-stakeholder consultation so that we can address this, uh, address this, address this in a multi-stakeholder uh, arena and then transform that, uh, say, because at the end of the day, these things will input into the entire R&D efforts so, so that at the end of the day, it will become a policy decision. And when it comes to a policy decision, of course, we have to defer to the political arm of the Climate Change Commission and those are the commissioners. But hopefully, all this will be transformed not only into R&D questions, but answers that a broad multi-stakeholder or arena can address. Yes, thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Agnes, again. So we have hands raised from Mars, Giorgio, and then we'll address the question from Elke, although she already put it in the, in the chat um, function. So, um, Mars, from Sharka, the floor is yours. Or rather, the mic. Hello. This is not Mars. This yes. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, hello, I'm BTS Proton from KMD. Um, my, my issue is very similar to the past question, the previous questions. My issue is really looking at indicators. What do you think is the possibility of, of uh, developing a national, like selecting national indicators? At least uh, minimal numbers. Uh, I think this can uh, have a this this can help us standardize some methodology for vulnerability uh, assessment. Uh, at least there are uh, national indicators, maybe one or three that could be common to all sites in the Philippines that our database can support. So what do you think of uh, coming up with uh, national indicators that uh, can be common to all of them? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vicky, and welcome. Your best friend will answer your question. So I hand it over now to Dr. Rosa Perez. Hi, Vicky. Thank you for your question. Um, I'm not... Um, 
I'm not discounting the possibility of uh, having this uh, national, top of national indicators, but probably the more appropriate is core indicators with us. But as you go down to the municipality or barangay level, these core indicators can be uh, more uh, more uh, explained in detail, or we can add some more indicators uh, as you go down the structure or the, the level of the level, no? Because uh, national indicators on with the national, uh, I'm not very comfortable with that. So core indicators might be the more appropriate. Is that okay with you? Okay. Um, yeah, we still have a question from Jojo before we um, put in Elvis and question. Okay, Jojo, you can use your microphone or use the chat function. Yeah. Okay, so what? While Jojo is preparing um, her question, we can go to Elsa's question on the status of Korean being the municipal planning and development council on the different vulnerability assessment methodology. Uh, I'm not here right now. Uh, with respect to the orientation of the SDDC, uh, we do these we do these things through our pilot economic projects. So, with respect to that, uh, there are ten uh, pilot economic uh, from Batanes to Mindanao or Shargao. But also there are other projects like the Green Phoenix project and uh, there are other uh, donor supported projects uh, which also includes uh, orienting our planning officers on the ground. Uh, so there are orientation uh, efforts towards say, uh, mitigation, uh, there are orientation efforts uh, regarding climate change adaptation and this is embedded in our EcoTown methodology. And if you want to know uh, the Ecotown methodology, let's just go to climate.gov.ch. You will just go to the download page or download the National Climate Change Action Plan. There's a description of the Ecotown methodology. And I turn you now to Agnes. Okay, so now we have three hands space, but I'm still waiting for um, a question coming from Jojo. But I see again that Jobe also raised um, a hand. Yeah, this is a follow-up question. And there's also another question coming in from Sharpest Group. Oh, sorry. Is there so, a question? Yeah. I just can't figure out how to unraise it. Hello? Yeah, so Sharika has the floor right now, using Mars account. Okay, so there's a question now from um, George Rajasikin. What are the ongoing discussions within government? So what are the things that are being discussed by the Climate Change Commission, for example, and Green Sea and NEDA on the uh, With respect to the NDRRSD, uh, there's an existing memorandum of understanding between the Climate Change Commission and the NDRRSD uh, regarding mainstream because we all know that uh, both RA10121, that's the one creating with the RRC, and RA9729, the one that created the climate change. Yeah, so the one that created the climate change commission, the one that created the climate change commission, 
So as you mentioned that there are certain projects, for example, that uh, in Phoenix, that's the rehabilitation and coordination of rehabilitation and response efforts. And it's a multi-agency, uh, meaning across government agencies, not just the, in the RRMC, but also other agencies, uh, for example, including the OSP, this is in relation to modeling, and this is, all of these are being coordinated. So that particular project has become a platform for convergence. So there are, there are coordin uh, coordination efforts and implement uh, piloting of implementation being done on the ground. And this uh, goes with the other uh, projects of uh, CCC. Now, I'd actually I'd like to mention here, uh, for example, the efforts that is supported by GIZ regarding identifying entry points uh, in the group process, entry points for CCACRR. So let's just wait for that, for example, for the completion of the consultation. Uh, regarding that and incidentally uh, I did not mention of course that our experts are also involved in that process. The, the next step of course will be identifying entry points uh, of CCD or RBCD with the CDD and we should not fail to mention also that the 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 ILG side and that uh, the local government academy are also trying to come up with efforts on, on drafting uh, guidelines for coming up with the local climate change action plan. And uh, with respect to NEDA, uh, we need also to await the process of the main training process uh, by NEDA on main training in the ADRR in the PSDP, uh, uh, Provincial Framework Development, uh, Provincial the Digital Framework Development Plan. Yes, thank you, Dennis. And just to add to that, NEDA, also I think with support from UNDP, is actually preparing a reference manual that can be referred to by local government unions when they want to also integrate the RRCPA into the comprehensive land use plan. And as Dennis mentioned, that HLURB right now is reviewing the guidelines for the CLUP and trying to embed not only the RRCPA but other thematic concerns. So, Jojo, we hope that uh, for now at least addresses your question. Um, we have another question coming from LPEC on what is being planned to be able to cover all LGUs who are in need of VA. So we are talking about, yeah. So I guess LPEC that is already answered by Dennis, uh, by Dennis response earlier. But I think also looking at it from the practical Side, no? We have how many municipalities or the fewer provinces. How do we expect to cover all these LGUs no? in, in the time that it needs also to update their CLU? Uh, before actually we go into the bone of the question, who are in need of vulnerability assessments, uh, I'm reminded of the, the uh, declaration made by Commissioner Sanyo. Perhaps what we need before we can go into pinpointing which LGUs, it should be, we need to come up, I don't we need to come up first with a national assessment. Because after we are able to do a, a, a finalized like methodology for the national assessment, then that assessment will be a pre preparatory question which LGUs should be prioritized in relation to a vulnerability assessment. So I'm reminded by that declaration of Commissioner Sanyo. So and that's of course the fact of the Climate Change Commission to come up with a national risk assessment. Thank you. Okay, so we have some more questions coming from the participants. Okay, can we click on the smiley button just to make sure that we are still together in this webinar? How many are still with us? Now? Okay, so at least Santiago from Germany is still with us. The Charter Group is with us. Thank you. Yes. So, yeah. A few of us still alive. Okay. So, okay. Are there any more questions? If you can still raise your hand or use the chat function. 
If none, I would like to hand over the microphone to Dennis for his brief summary and to give us a preview of the next step for the community of that. Uh, thank you, Agnes. So this entire exercise, uh, for example, uh, after, right after the presentation of our two experts, uh, this will also form uh, part of the discussion uh, of their study, and this is in relation to monitoring and evaluation. Also, uh, we encourage you to give feedback regarding your suggested topics for the next set of webinars, or suggestions in general regarding vulnerability and impact assessment frameworks, tools, and indices. Also, of course, uh, this pilot run uh, will show that uh, we are going into looking at an online platform based on the capacity building tool because we know that especially for vulnerable LGUs and communities, especially those that don't have budget to send people for capacity development, this online tool can perhaps uh, fit in the uh, need for capacity development on climate change action. Now, of course, this, this discussion shall contribute to further fine-tuning uh, opportunity, for, opportunity for giving feedback and need the informal validation of CCADRR frameworks in the and tools. So, in closing, this pilot run of the webinar of the Community of Practice on Climate Change Action will be, will be of course, the start of a meaningful discussion and frameworks in the and tools so that we, as a community, will be able to help vulnerable communities and LGUs better adapt to the impact of climate change. And uh, having uh, mentioned that, uh, of course, the next step, steps are the following. Uh, if we can show them uh, on our slide, please. So, regarding what we can do next, uh, of course, the Climate Change Commission, in relation to coming up the community, with the community of practice, are our vision is also to, to come up with making sure that this webinar, this community of practice will be more sustainable. So perhaps uh, there can be discussions regarding how to embed uh, this particular capacity building activity into the budget of a specific agency so that we can continue on doing this. So having um, mentioned that, we'd like to turn your attention to the next set of activities in this case. The first is the conference on building blocks for climate resilience from local communities in the Philippines. And uh, that will be held uh, on November 27, 28. And this is, will be part of the Climate Change Consciousness Week. So this will be at the University of the Philippines and this is part of the interdisciplinary program on climate change and disaster reduction with the World Sacro Forestry Center and the Oscar and Lopez Center. And of course special mention that since uh, Dr. Vicky Spalding is attending. Now, what are the objectives of the conference? These are as follows. First, to present an array of tools and methodologies being used in the country and elsewhere in climate change adaptation and mitigation. Second, is to examine selected case studies from different landscapes and locations in the country. Third, to conduct tutorials with specific and successful methodologies for rapid adoption and upscaling. And lastly, identify and prioritize research and development concerns of local communities. So, of course, again, as I mentioned, a uh, special, special citation to Dr. Barbique Espaldon. Uh, she's the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension, and is also a Professor for Geography and Environmental Science at the University of the Philippines, Los Angeles. So, uh, friends and colleagues and mentors, I turn you back to uh, Agnes and especially uh, that a lot of questions were posed regarding the documentation and the request for the copies of the presentation. So thank you for participating uh, in the final round of the webinar. Thank you.
Thank you, Danny. So this is actually a test also for the community of practitioners of DVDs not to run such a webinar, and we expect more webinars in the future according to topics of relevance that you would also like to recommend to us that we can tackle later on. So, yeah, before we formally close, I would just like to ask Dr. Kendra Sotanko about the next step uh, with regards to this study. Since we've been talking about um, um, having core indices that can be used at the national um, level and where our different MLE systems that are already set up can be tapped already. So just to give us a sort of, just to give us an idea of the next steps for this particular study and what can we expect from it. Uh, so we are in the HKA project now and the doctor got uh, and myself to come up with a climate change vulnerability index that is rooted in the group CDT and the NPF. So we'll be reviewing the, the planning process and the indicators that are already being used there to see how we can incorporate it or link it to the vulnerability assessment framework and come up with recommendations for maintaining the VA into these study processes that are already uh, existing and to make it relevant to the CDP and as well as to the MTC. Thank you, Dr. Kedra. So for the request for the presentation, yes, we will be able to extract your email addresses from when you log in to this webinar. But other than the presentation, I think it's much more valuable if we provide you with a paper that that has actually been prepared by Dr. Rosa and Dr. Kendra for this presentation. So the recording of the webinar can also be access to um, adaptationcommunity.net. If you want to listen to if you want to listen to the recording again, and you can do so by accessing a link there. So yeah. Okay, I'm typing it in now. So it's adaptationcommunity.net. So yeah, you can access the recording there. And we we'll email you um, individually the presentation and the paper. So that's it from my side. Can we give all ourselves a round of applause, please? Yes.